Well, it is great to be here. Um, just kind of as a, a way of information, uh, so Pastor John and I, we've been kind of talking about when was the right time for us to kind of start switching pulpits again. Uh, we wanted to give you uh, some time to really get to know who John was, and so it's been about nine months or so that he's been your primary pastor. And so what we're going to be doing now is every two months uh, we'll switch out pulpits, uh, so that way we kind of integrate both pastors in. Uh, so I'm excited to be back here. It's, it's always awesome to preach here. Uh, Parker was telling me this morning, he's like, Grace, I just love being there. It's just a neat church. Uh, so I, I feel the same way. It's, it's awesome being back here. Uh, great being here with you. Uh, so today I'm going to be preaching over uh, the words I am. Uh, there's actually seven I am statements found within the book of John. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I want you to kind of think about what Jesus says about who he is as a, as a person, as, as, um, yeah, as, as a person. Uh, so the seven I am statements are as follows. It says, I am the true vine, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the good shepherd, the gate, the resurrection and the life, and then the way, the truth, and the life. So why is it so important to, to know who Jesus is? Why is it important to study these I am statements? Well, it's kind of interesting because I uh, was at training with this guy. Um, uh, he is a Jewish rabbi. And um, we got to talking quite a bit. And one of the things that Jewish rabbis basically do is they follow the law. So if it's said it in the Old Testament, they're going to follow that. And then they're going to add on 639 laws onto that as well. And so their life is all about following God. And so it's not really about having a relationship with God. It's about doing all the right things at all the right times. And so it was interesting because uh, we were driving on the bus to train in one time, and I, I smelled something. I'm like, Rabbi, do you, do you smell that? And I was like, I think that's bacon coming from the Burger King. And I was like, doesn't bacon smell so good? I bet you wish you could just have some bacon. Okay, now Jew, Jewish people can't have bacon. And so he, he was very witty, and he came back at me, and he said this. He's like, you know... That bacon does smell good, and I'll remind you of that when I'm sitting at the right hand of God, and you're burning in hell for that. Um, but because that's about the relationship, like for Jewish people, it's like God said it, so I'm going to follow, it, I'm going to obey it, and it's not about relationship. You don't know a personal God. Um, it's all about doing the right things. It's about following the guidelines. And so, what's interesting as as Christians. Um, we believe in the authority of Scripture. We're not going to basically say we don't need Scripture at all. Uh, but what we do believe even stronger is, is that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So our relationship with Christ dictates how we read the Scripture, how we interpret it. And so uh, we believe that God actually put on flesh. It's called the incarnation. That God actually literally came down and he became one of us through his son Jesus Christ. And so what's different from us and the Jewish, the Jewish faith is that we believe that, one, we can have a relationship with Jesus. And the second thing is we believe that we can actually know what God is like because we know his son. And so uh, the idea is if you know Jesus, then you know God. Now, my Jewish friend, he would say that that's blasphemy. He doesn't want to hear anything about Jesus Christ because uh, for, for Jewish people, God would never do that. God would never lower himself in a way like that. But what's amazing about Christianity is really that we can have this relationship with Jesus Christ and we can know what God is like firsthand through Jesus. So that's why we're studying the I am statement today. Um, it's because I want you to have a, a closer relationship with Jesus. I want you to know what God is like. And I think that's so cool because we can actually know what our God, the creator of the universe, the one who made you know, 300 billion stars and 100 billion galaxies, created atoms and all the things that we think of uh, that are just beyond us, we can know that God personally. Our God's not distant. God's right with us. In fact, uh, later on in the series when I talk about the eye and the bread, you actually realize that when you take in the bread, that God becomes part of you on a cellular level because it's broken down and it's part of who you are now. So it's just so cool how God has fashioned all this in his design. So uh, the idea here is to, to go one step deeper and develop a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, so I want to just ask you a question. Um, think about it in your head anyway. Um, how many friends do you have on social media? All right. Um, 
you put all your, your Facebook and your Instagram and AOL, Instant Messenger, you know, some people are way back on that one, um, Snapchat, things like that, if you, if you put them all together, how many do you think you have? Um, I, I did some research and I had, uh, recently I had 683 friends on Facebook. And it was interesting because my wife, she gets on me for this. She's like, why do you have so many friends on Facebook? You don't even know these people. And I said, well, I'm a pastor. If I start basically denying all these people, then people are going to get mad. So, so unless um, it's an inappropriate person, uh, I'm going to friend them on Facebook because I, I have to because I'm a pastor. And my wife and I debate about this back and forth. Uh, but with her, she only has like 300-some friends on Facebook. And the reason why is because uh, she actually goes through and she purges friends on Facebook. She'll say, I haven't known this person for like two years, and so I'm going to just take them off. I'm going to delete them. So if you ever have my wife delete you off Facebook, it's not that she's trying to be mean. It's just that she's trying to conduct, condense it and con you know, make it concise. She, she would say, like, I know that person, but I don't really know that person, if you know what I mean. You know, so what she wants is she wants a relationship with other people. She doesn't want this impersonal kind of relationship that you find. And, and that's the relationships that we have often have in our culture today. Uh, we have these impersonal relationships with other people. We know people, but we don't really know people. You know, I went to a church when I was at training, and they had over 2,000 people there on a Sunday. It was really, it was cool. And, and great and all this, but I didn't know anybody around me. Um, at the end of the service, nobody said hi to me. Uh, we just kind of walked out of the building all together. It's kind of like watching cattle, you know, follow a single line out the door. You know, nobody spoke to each other. And I was like, okay, so we, we can know all these people. We can worship with all these people, but we don't really know them as human beings. And so the question is, how do we truly know somebody? Um, psychologists have actually researched this, and they say if you want to know somebody, you have to know their life. You have to know what the struggles that they're having, um, what makes them happy, um, what makes them tick. And that's a slow process. And in our culture today, we don't really have time to really know people, to invest in people the way that we should. And so all that being said, um, you know, some sermons are designed to help you understand the Bible more. Uh, some people, some sermons are, are meant to kind of inspire you. What I want you to do here is I want you to know who Jesus is. I want you to develop that relationship with him. I want you to know at the end of this, like, who is Jesus and what did he come to do? Because I think for a lot of us, we have taken it for granted. Like, we, we think we know who Jesus is because we went to Sunday school. We've heard a few sermons. We've been in church for the last uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And so we think we know uh, who he is. But I think we need to sometimes take a, a look at that relationship once again. So today I'm going to be reading from uh, John chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can open them up and you can go through it along with me. Uh, we'll be doing the Sunday school after church today, so we'll kind of take a deeper look into this as well. And we'll talk about it. Uh, but John chapter 4, it starts off and it says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back more, uh, back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. Uh, he, so he came to a town in Samaria called Secure, near a plot of ground uh, Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. So the very first thing that I want you to notice here is that Jesus is going a certain way. And they make a note of saying this. Now, it sounds... Like, this isn't really a big deal. But I want to show you this. Uh, this is actually a map, right? All right? Uh, that's probably the dumbest thing I've said all day. Uh, this is a map. All right. Uh, so when, if you were a Jewish person and you're going from Judea right here. Oh, it's not going to show. Uh, but bottom part of the screen, if you're going from Judea, uh, as a Jewish person, you would actually go um, kind of follow that dotted line all the way outside of that kind of beige area. And the reason is, is because that beige area there is all Samaritan controlled area. And so the Samaritans, you, you don't like them. Uh, they're dirty people. They're unclean. They were once the Israelites, but they married off and they intermarried. And so they're just unpure people. 
Plus, they've been in com conflict with, with the Jewish people for years now. And so you do everything that you can to avoid this route. So what Jesus does is he actually goes straight from Judea all the way up north, and he's traveling straight through this land. This is something that's unheard of with Jewish people, especially Jewish rabbis. They would avoid this area like the plague. And so this little line in the scripture, it says so much. Why would Jesus be going through this area? There, there's another way, there's a common way that Jewish people would go through, um, but he does this intentionally, all right? So we get back to uh, verse 6. It says, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down um, at the well, and it was about noon. So noon is the, the hottest part of the day um, in Israel, and it's, it's a time where like everybody would just kind of take a break. Um, you would go relax under a tree for a little bit, get some shade, because it was so hot that you could, couldn't physically work. And so this was a common practice back then. You would get kind of tired at the midday point. You'd go find some shade and relax until the sun kind of cooled off a little bit. All right, verse 7. This is, this is probably the most important verse, okay? Um, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. I know it sounds kind of silly that this is the most important verse, but even just that portion of it. So this tells us, so much. All right, so this was a woman's job back then. Uh, a woman basically stayed in her house, and she was in charge of the whole thing. But she had one task that she had to do every single day, and that was to get water. It doesn't matter what time you got water, but there was a common practice. You would always get water in the early morning time. Now, the reason why is because, one, it was really cool at that time of day. But the second thing is that all the women would come together, and this was their time to kind of socialize, uh, to talk to each other, and kind of get to know what's going on in their day. So you have this, this woman, and she's coming at the hottest time of the day, when nobody physically works, uh, when everything's kind of shut down. Why in the world would she be coming at this time of the day, the hottest part of the day? It says a lot in that little short sentence. All right, so continue on. Jesus said, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now, this is another thing that, that's really weird because uh, Jewish men uh, would never talk to any women in public. Uh, even if it was their wife, they would very rarely talk even to their wife in public. Now, a single Jewish man, a single Jewish man who's also a rabbi, would never, ever, ever talk to a woman out in public. This is unheard of. And you can actually see this in her response in verse 9. It says, The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Right there. Like, she names it. Like, this is really weird. Why are you talking to me? How can you ask me for a drink? And just in case you didn't pick up, pick up on it before, there's these parentheses that basically said, For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So imagine the shock from this woman she, she goes there expecting to be alone, and she meets this Jewish rabbi, and he actually talks to her. I mean, this was the weirdest day ever for her. And Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So there's a, a phrase there called living water. and In the original Greek, uh, what that means is, is not like well water. You know, well water is kind of sitting down there, and you pull it up, and, and it's, it's okay. Um, but well water can be kind of dangerous because animals can fall into the well. They can die in there. Um, it can be kind of, kind of stale and kind of gross water. So really, the, the premier water that you really want to have would be spring water, which is living water, water that kind of bubbles up from the ground. And this spring water was very useful because it could be used for ritual purposes. Uh, but above all, it just it was cleaner and it tasted better. And so this woman is thinking, "You're you're going to give me literal spring water?" She's like, "This is this is great." And so she's looking for this location. If you know of where this location is, she wants to know of it. She wants to know where the spring of living water is. But Jesus is not talking about uh, physical things anymore. He's actually moving on to spiritual. So verse 11 it says, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock. 
But Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will never be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw this water. All right, take a second and read between the lines in that. So what is she really saying? Uh, so that I don't have to keep coming back to draw this water. So we, we start to kind of put all this together. So what is she really saying? She's saying, give me this water so that I don't have to keep coming out here day after day. Well, why is that? Well, there, there's something going on in her life. This woman is ashamed of something. She, she doesn't want to be around other people. She doesn't want to be seen out in public. So she's hiding from people. And this is the reason why she's coming at the hottest part of the day when everybody's taking a break from all their work, uh, when there's no women at the well whatsoever. She is hiding from other people. And what she really, really wants is she wants to know where this other source of water is so that she can completely hide. And in fact, she really wants water that, that lasts forever so she doesn't ever have to come out of her house. So she wants, uh, above all, just to hide in her home, uh, away from shame, away from guilt. She doesn't want to be with anybody out in public. So if she could just get her hands on this new water, she can continue to hide in her life, and nobody ever has to see her again. But what Jesus does is Jesus doesn't allow her to, to stay in hiding. Uh, Jesus actually confronts that sin, and he pulls it out. So he says in verse 16, he told her, Go and call your husband. Um, go call your husband and come back. And she says, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right when you said you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man that you are with now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. So this sounds kind of mean, but Jesus isn't trying to be mean. He's exposing what she wants to keep hidden. And yet, even though it is exposed, she doesn't run off and just basically hide again. She stays there with Jesus, which, which says something about her as well. And what, what I want you to think about is this. like, Okay, so this woman has sin in her life. She's been married multiple times. She's, she's living um, with another man right now, and she's not married to him. This is a very taboo thing. But each one of us has sin in our life. Each one of us has something hidden deep within us. That we don't want other people to know of. We're ashamed of it. Uh, sins that kind of keep us awake at night. Sins that really bother us. That we're ashamed of. That we want to keep hidden from other people. So I think we can kind of relate with this woman. There are some things that we just don't want other people to know about. But here's what Jesus shows us. That in order to gain control over our sin, we have to acknowledge it. In order to start healing, we have to get that sin out in front of us. We can't just hide from it forever. So if you skip down to verse 25, it says this, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. So what's interesting is, is we often read this as she's saying that Jesus is the, is the Messiah, but nowhere in this does she actually say Jesus is the Messiah. She's basically saying, I know of this one guy. He's going to come someday. The Bible talks about it. You know, he's, he's going to be the Messiah, but she never says that Jesus is. And so Jesus declares this, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This is the first time that he's told somebody that he is the Messiah, that this is the first time he's really declared it to anyone else, that he is the one who is coming. Jesus declared, I am. I am the Messiah. I'm the one that you're waiting for. And what's really interesting is this. Look who he told it to. To a sinner. To a woman who is an outcast. And in fact, she's so much of an outcast that she's an outcast among the Samaritan people who are an outcast of the Jewish people. I mean, this is like three layers of outcasts, right? And, and she's been married multiple times and she's still living in sin. Uh, this is like the least likely person that you would ever tell this to. I mean, why would you tell it to somebody like this? You know, nobody's going to believe her. But he does. So one of the things that I, I love about the I Am statements is, is we know the character of Jesus. 
We know what Jesus is truly like in his everyday behavior. And so we can say if Jesus is like this, then we know that God is like this as well. So I want to give you three things that we learn about the very nature of the God who created you and me. The very first thing is this, that God is seeking you out even if you're hiding the woman is isolated. She's living in shame. She wants to keep hidden. She wants to be apart from other people. But what's interesting is, is that Jesus intentionally went that other way. And Jesus was at the well at that time where she was there. You know, it, it's not just coincidence. Jesus intentionally sought her out. And that's what God does for us. You know, within the Methodist uh, theology, we have this thing called pervenient grace. Um, Presbyterians, Calvinists, they have it called common grace, but, but what we believe as provenient grace is this, is that God's love continues to seek you out, no matter where you are in life, that God is continually trying to find you, kind of prod into your life so, so that you can see that God truly does love you. And actually our Atlas program, the after school program, is all based on that. What we try to do there is we try to love the kids that are there because we want them to see the love of God in their life. And, and this, is, this is what we're trying to do, because a lot of them are from unsure families, uh, broken families. Uh, it actually reminds me of this young woman who, who used to go to Atlas. She's kind of aged out of the program, but um, she came from a very broken home. Uh, single mom, she had lots of different stepsisters uh, and stepbrothers because the family kind of had multiple families. Um, all over the place. Um, there's lots of drugs involved in her family. She comes from uh, a home that looks like it should be condemned. But each week she was there at Atlas. And she had a smile on her face. And she knew uh, that we all loved her. That, that we as a church stood by her. And we don't know what's going to happen with that information. If she's going to change who, or the trajectory of her life or, or not. But we do know this, that we showed her love, just like God shows us love. So this is a, a great point that God is seeking you out, even if you're hiding. God's going to find you. He's going to provide opportunities to show you his love in his life. Second thing that we learn is that God is not okay with sin. Um, there we go. God confronts sin. See, Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter. He brings up the sin that's, that's in her life. I mean, it sounds kind of harsh that Jesus is like saying, this is who you are, this is what you've done. But when you bring light into darkness, the darkness goes away. See, sin is funny because we think that by hiding it, we're going to have some kind of control over it. But actually, the opposite is true. Hiding your sin only enslaves you even further. And so what Jesus does is he enables the healing process to start. He basically says, this is what's happened. Uh, this is who you are. Uh, it's not okay, but we're going to get through this. See, as Christians, we like to pretend that we all have it together. And the truth of this is all of us have sin in our life, and each one of us is a master at hiding it. We don't want other people to see it. We want to hide it so we can keep up that nice smile on our face, pretend like everything's okay. But it goes back to our thing that I spoke about earlier with relationships. You know, we like to have these impersonal relationships where we really, really don't have to get to know people. But, but what God wants for us and what we find in the early church is that we need those small groups, those interactions with people in Bible studies and small group settings where we can actually become vulnerable with each other, where we can actually share what's going on in our lives. Um, I have a small group that's a men's group that meets every Saturday morning. And uh, Stacy McCoy always asks this question, so, so how is it with your soul? what's going on in your life we need those groups where we can be vulnerable with each other so Jesus is not okay with sin and the last thing that we learn is this uh, we learn that God is personal and above all he desires a relationship so my, my Jewish friend only had part of it yeah God wants us to follow his commands but at the same point time God wants us to be in a relationship with us, uh, wants to be in a relationship with us and that's why Jesus makes the time to go out and find this woman. And he's not all about the rules and the guidelines and condemning and judging her. He's basically sitting down and having a conversation with her and loving her and inviting her into a relationship with him. So what I see is, is this, that God doesn't care what you've done in your past. You know, it's all the past. 
But what God does is he wants you to take that sin out of your life and start a relationship with him today. So I'm going to close with that thought that what God wants most is a relationship and that relationship comes through our belief in Jesus Christ. When we believe that Jesus died and rose again, he comes alive in our hearts and that living water flows through us. So let's take a moment and we'll pray. Heavenly God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for all these things that we learn about your son, Jesus Christ, and we also learn about you, the creator of the universe. Lord, we know that you want a personal relationship with us, and that only comes through your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, uh, we might have been putting it off for a while, we might not have been serious about it, but we really do want to invite Jesus into our hearts. We want him to live in our lives. We believe in him, we believe that he died and that he rose again, and that through him we can have eternal life and live in the water. And so, Lord, we just invite the Lord Jesus into our hearts into our lives. We want to live for you. We want to uh, be free from the sin that uh, entangles us in this life. We just want to live every single day the rest of our lives devoted to you and your son Jesus. We pray this in your name.